janitor and bottle washer here at the church. And <clears throat> it's an honor to be at a church where they let the janitor also speak. And so today we're in 2 Samuel verse chapter number 11, uh, verse number 1. It happened in the spring of the year at the time when kings go out to battle that David sent Joab and his servants with him and all Israel, and they destroyed the people of Ammon and besieged Rabbah. But David remained at Jerusalem. Then it happened one evening that David rose from his bed and walked on the roof of the king's house. And from the roof, he saw a woman bathing, and the woman was very beautiful to behold. I should have all the young men say amen, but we will not do that. <laughs> My Lord, we had the, this side of the church get all blessed on that. <laughs> amen. This is a story of David's fall and his error and his sin. And I'm going to preach for a few moments today from this subject, songs of repentance. Songs of repentance. Smile at somebody nearby and say, aren't you glad for repentance in your life? Amen. God bless you. You may be seated. We are continuing our look, our review of the life of David. Uh, his life has so much spiritual significance, so much spiritual wisdom that can be shared and taught. We are endeavoring to learn from it. Paul said it best, these stories, these books of the Old Testament were given to us as examples, and we read them, and we find uh, doctrine in them, we find truth in them, we find example, we even find reproof in them. And this moment that we read together, <clears throat> excuse me, is not the highlight of David's life. This is the, the nadir. This is the low point of his life, because he is about to commit perhaps the ugliest sin of his reign and his kingship. <coughs> And the story is as old as sin itself. There's nothing particularly unique about this story. And you see in it sin as a picture and as an example. And then you see in it the challenge that comes to the sinner, uh, which seems like judgment but is really a form of rescue. Did you hear that? It seems like judgment, but it's really a form of rescue. And then finally, you see repentance and you see the promise of pardon that comes to David uh, through, through the prophet and through the promises of God. Sin is real and it is near to all of us. Wouldn't it be great if we on this side of the church could look at this side of the church and think that those guys over there are the sinners and we over here are the righteous? Wouldn't that be great? I know that's a very religious thing to do, but that's not, it's not that complicated. It's not that simple. It's much more complicated. The truth is, is all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Now, I want to I, I want to ask you today to to receive this message. It, it's much more enjoyable, shall we say, uh, to preach in a certain tone, a certain style about the greatness of God and the surety of our victory. And the, I read the back of the book, and we won, and everyone loves that kind of a thing. But if that's all a preacher preaches, then he's not really doing his God-given job. Some preaching needs to be a challenge to us. And I want to preach today in a manner that will challenge sin in every one of our lives. From the platform to the Great Awakenings Coffee Cafe out there, I want to challenge sin in all of our lives. Because none of us can point our finger and say, oh, he needs that today. She needs that today. The truth is, we all of us need a challenge of sin. It's interesting that this temptation came to David in the time when he really had something else he should have been doing. Uh, I think a lot of sin comes out of idleness. I think a lot of temptation comes out of the fact that you really just did not uh, stay focused on the best use of your time. But in the distraction of all your many other entertainments, you were pulled away and what started as a type of uh, distraction turns into a transgression in your life. In the time when kings go to battle, David stays behind and he delegates the job to his general and he's having a really good life. In fact, uh, he's either, he's either 
uh, waking up in the afternoon, the Bible says evening, uh, that can be any time from uh, late afternoon when the sun begins to set uh, all the way into uh, the night hours. Uh, he's either waking up from a nice nap, summer nap. I, I, one of the blessings of God is a nice nap. Uh, it really is just a way that the Lord lets you know things are going to be all right. In fact, if you're having a bad day this week, work your schedule out where you can just take a little nap, just 20 minutes. It'll make your day better. Thus saith the Lord. <laughs> he either wakes up from a nap, which is really an awesome thing to do, or he is troubled in his sleep and he wakes up and can't sleep at night. So either, either it's a uh, having a really good time uh, taking a nap, or it is a restlessness in him and he wakes up at night and he goes out and he stands to survey. Perhaps he stands on the battlement of a wall. Perhaps he stands at the high place of his fortress and he looks over his, his city. Uh, this probably was a regular habit for him. Uh, it might even have been a place of, of reflection for him. It might even have been, dare I suggest it, a place of devotion for him. It might have been a place where he thought about his responsibilities. It may have been a time of reflection when he looked over all the people that depended on him to have his act together. But whatever the case, this day, uh, he looks down and there's a beautiful woman. Uh, she's bathing in his sight. And he, seeing her, is uh, brought to a moment of lust. Now, I want to point this out and I want to be fair about it. And I want to be real about it because there's nothing, nothing more useless than a preacher playing make-believe. I want to be real about it. The truth is, for any heterosexual guy, which is the majority of guys, this would be a moment of temptation. This would not be the guy deciding they're going to be, uh, you know, uh, a hound dog. This would not be them deciding they wanted to go forth and, you know, do dastardly deeds for the good of us all. Uh, that's, not, that's, that's not what's happening here. For, for any heterosexual man, this would be a, a moment of temptation and perhaps even a difficult moment. And it started as an accidental sighting. Uh, I don't know if Bathsheba had a reputation for taking baths in convenient places. Uh, I don't think so. Um, I, I don't know. I'm just being real. I, I don't know. Uh, may, maybe she was a little bit, little bit bold. Uh, maybe not. It, it's unfair for us to know or pretend we know. Maybe it's just that the only place of privacy she had was the rooftop, and uh, she, that's where she took, took her bath, and for whatever reason, she was bathing herself, and so here you have a king that looks down, sees a beautiful woman. It could be a temptation for any man. In fact, I'll go further than that and say in a, different, in a, in a reversal of roles, uh, it could be a temptation uh, if the sexes were reversed. It could be a temptation for, the, for any, not any woman, but a lot of women. Uh, I won't continue in that line. I'll just mention it and leave it right there. Uh, this is a moment of temptation. Uh, he now has to decide what to do with uh, this temptation. And this is the moment when temptation turns into a progression, a uh, slope, so to speak, down which we slide into sin. And he, having been tempted, must now decide what he will do. Uh, as, as kings are somewhat wont to do in this moment, uh, David decides the wrong decision, and he decides that as king of the land, he should keep a good eye on the situation. He is not without access to the fairer sex. As a king, he really doesn't have a whole lot of shortage of opportunities to uh, have flirtatious moments. Um, he is the king, and in the manner of a king, he has access, uh, and he um, does uh, something that is beyond his uh, right place as a king. He begins to inquire after this woman, so temptation has turned into sin. Perhaps he should have had some mechanism in his life whereby he was saved from this. Perhaps he should have had something that would have stopped him, but he didn't. Uh, he thinks, you know, I'm the king, I'm here, uh, look at there. It's a beautiful day, and all of us men, all of us men, and, all, and most of the women, perhaps different contexts, but we all recognize temptation, and we know when temptation comes, and we know the moment when it goes beyond temptation until now it is a decision, there is an intent 
that is now shackled to the temptation. Um, it's quiet today. That means I'm preaching a good challenging message, which was my goal, and I'm pleased with that. So here uh, you have this man going from temptation to sin. Now, the battle between the sexes, as we like to say, is as old as humankind. The whole manner in which men are tempted, the manner in which women are tempted, we all of us need safeguards in our life. Can I have an amen? Amen. We all of us need, if you are in a married relationship, you need a open relationship with your wife so uh, you are able to be honest and a good wife can save you from a lot of yourself. Yes, yes they can. Uh, if that makes you awkward, I apologize and we'll move swiftly along. Uh, you know, it's like the joke about the guy who is in the grocery store walking all over the place, one of these supermarkets. He's walking all over the place. And finally, he sees a beautiful woman, and he walks over to her, and he says, um, uh, can I talk to you for a few moments? And she said, why, why do you want to talk to me for a few moments? He says, well, I've lost my wife in this huge store, but I've noticed that whenever I spend a few moments talking to a beautiful woman, she appears out of nowhere. <laughs> So, so we all of us, we all of us have ch checks in our life that should save us from these moments of temptation. And uh, God help you if you pretend like you don't have temptation because you've set yourself up for a huge snare. You're safest when you admit you're weak. Okay, so if any, if 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 you hear anybody in the, any man or any woman in a different context admit to their weaknesses, you should not think bad of them. You should think that's a humble heart that has a spiritual desire to do right and to safeguard against the flesh. And so uh, David now turns temptation to intent. <clears throat> he inquires after her. He finds out she is Bathsheba. The, the daughter of Eliam and the wife of Uriah the Hittite. This is significant because both um, Eliam and uh, Uriah are soldiers in David's army. More importantly, they have been with him for a very long time. They have been with him from before he became king. They came to him while he was running for his life and they have been faithful to him. This is the path of sin. Sin will destroy the most valuable relationships in your life. We know that Uriah was one of David's mighty men, not just a nobody, but a mighty man of valor and discipline, a warrior of the highest caliber, a noted historically in glory among the memories in the uh, history of Israel. David ignores the friendship. He calls Bathsheba to be brought to him. Uh, and they begin this relationship, and however it happens, <clears throat> whatever manner the transgression happens, uh, whether or not Bathsheba was in a position where she could uh, refuse it or whether she could not refuse it, we don't know. We should probably not speculate too much. Uh, but the point is, lust, when it is conceived, bringeth forth sin. Okay, so now we've gone from lust to sin, and David, David has a, an affair with the wife of a very lo loyal soldier who, while he is transgressing, while David is transgressing, this loyal soldier, Uriah, is fighting David's battle in the field. He is fighting David's enemies in the field. Uh, David, perhaps... Uh, thinks that this is something that he's got out of his system and he's, he's done with it and perhaps no one will ever know. But there's a problem and that is he finds out a few weeks later that Bathsheba is with child and this is a bigger problem. David is going into cover-up mode and it's interesting how many of the greatest lapses of ethics are not the transgression but the cover-up. In fact, politically, if you look at political history, people are much more often destroyed by the cover-up than they are by the transgression. In fact, they had a window to come clean, and when they didn't do that, they went into this increasing problematic maze of uh, fraudulent cover-up. And so David brings home, he sends a letter to the battlefield to send Uriah home, hoping that perhaps he will be with his wife and the pregnancy is early enough to where it will all just be kind of swept under the rug. And so Uriah comes home, but Uriah is faithful in a, in a, to a high level. And his heart, his, he's bonded to the troops that follow him in the field. And none of them got to come home. None of them were able to give an, an unexpected and unexplained battlefield leave where they get to come home and live the life of Riley, so to speak, and then uh, go back. They're all still in the field. They're all still risking their life. And Uriah, on principle, says as a small, shall we say, protest to this unexplained leave. 
leave he has been given, uh, that it's in some manner not right for him to be sitting at home while the men that are following him are in the field. Do you see how this is a small rebuke, unspoken but lived in honor and dignity? It's a small rebuke of David. Do you see that? <clears throat> I'm not going to come home and live this good life while my brothers are in the field fighting. Now, David didn't have any problem with this. Okay, and so this shows the increasing error, the increasing sin, the increasing evil of David because Uriah will not go home and remove this potential embarrassment to David by being with his wife. Uh, he moves to phase two. He writes a letter to his general Joab. He says, put Uriah in the front line that he may be killed. He gives the letter. Notice his faith and trust in the goodness and the honor of Uriah. He he gives the letter to Uriah to deliver to Joab. In other words, he so firmly trusts the honor and the goodness of this man Uriah that he gives him his own death warrant and tells him to deliver it to Joab knowing that Uriah is too honorable to ever try to peek, to look, to spy upon the message that's being sent. And Uriah doesn't. He goes back. Joab puts him in the middle of the battle at the lead and he is killed. Now David has gone from lust to the sin of adultery. Now he's gone from that to fraud and from fraud to premeditated first degree murder, conspiracy to commit murder. And it has worked. The plan has come to fruition. And that honorable man, that good man, that righteous man, that warrior of distinction is slain on the battlefield intentionally by the commander who has transgressed against him and sinned against him by sleeping with his wife. Bathsheba hears that her husband is dead. She goes into a time of mourning. After the mourning is over, David sends for her and makes her his wife. This thing has gotten way more complicated than David ever intended when he stood on his balcony and saw a pretty woman. Sin has this ability to take us down an increasingly complicated road, like a wormhole that never seems to end. We find one problem after another. One lie begets another lie. One fraud begets another fraud. One transgression begets another transgression. David has sin tremendously. And I want to point out something to you that I think is so, so important. Uh, sin doesn't feel like sin when it's, being ha when it's happening. Do, 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 let me repeat that. Sin doesn't feel like sin in the moment of its transgression. Remember, David is not a man given to the things of the flesh. David doesn't have some evil history. He is a man after God's heart. He is a man who spends his life writing songs, writing hymns that become the book of Psalms that we worship with even today. David, in his very character, his personality, is a follower of God, and yet in one chapter, in one chapter, somebody say one chapter. Chapter number 11, second book of Samuel. In one chapter, David has broken five of the Ten Commandments. When David is sinning, as good as he is, as uh, inclined toward worship as he is, as good of a singer, as good of as a musician, as good as a worshiper as, as he is. I want you to see that sin is still in his heart. The potential for transgression is still in his heart. While he's writing that song, the potential to be with Bathsheba is in his heart. While he is dancing before the Lord, the potential for sin is still in his heart. The Sin is there, and it is already in his heart. Although it starts small, the potential is there. And once given fruitful soil to grow in, sin grows so rapidly that in one chapter you can break half the laws of God without even realizing where it started or where it's going to end. Sin, hear me, is deeply deceiving. In the moment, sin doesn't feel like the evil that it is. Uh, one writer, Eugene Peterson, in his book on David, he wrote this. The subtlety of sin is that it doesn't feel like sin when we're doing it. David didn't feel like a sinner when he sent for Bathsheba. He felt like a lover. He didn't feel like a murderer when he put Uriah in the front lines. He felt like a king. Sin is deeply 
deceiving. Sin is unmanageable. The error of our hearts is that we can manage the sin. And David, you can almost imagine him saying this to himself, I'll go this far and no further. But sin keeps progressing. It keeps pulling him. And sin always takes you, as the preachers have said from time immemorial, farther than you want to go and keeps you longer than you want to say. Sin dwells deep in our nature. If David is capable after all of his songs and all of his worship and all the anointing upon him, if he's still capable of this, heaven forbid we think we are incapable of sin and we are incapable of error. We must walk humbly before our God. Can I have a big amen? The seed of sin is ever within us. The seed of sin. It's like God told Cain when he was beginning to hate his brother. When he was beginning to resent his brother, God spoke to Cain and said, Sin is crouching at the door. It is waiting in the shadows of your heart, waiting to pounce and devour you. And so David good man, great worshiper, great singer, a man after the heart of God, a man who has seen the justice of God and the mercy of God, a man who shouted when they brought the presence of God back into the city of David, a man who is zealous and intent and intentional in his worship and in his praise, a man who has spent his life pursuing the presence of God and the anointing of God. This man has committed this terrible, terrible sin. And God God is now going to challenge him. Judgment and challenge is going to come to David. It's going to feel like judgment, but it's really divine rescue. I'm thankful for rescue. The the Bible says this thing that David had done displeased the Lord. And the Lord sends David a friend, and the friend is the prophet Nathan And uh, you'll remember uh, the words in the Proverbs, faithful are the wounds of a friend. Uh, I pray all of us have spiritual people in our life who will call us on our... (laughs) Hopefully we have a preacher in our life who will call us on our... (laughs) too. (laughs) You're you're wondering what... (laughs) is. Well, just use your imagination. And the prophet comes to David, and he doesn't come in the manner of an angry man. He'll have his moment, never you doubt, but he doesn't come in that manner. He comes with a story. He brings a narrative. He tells the king a story of injustice in his kingdom, and he uses the context of something that David can identify with. He tells the story of shepherds. David grew up as a shepherd. David's formative years were as a shepherd. David remembers all the struggle, the struggles, dangers, and perhaps even injustices that happened to him as a shepherd. And so the prophet is going to relate to him in the context of his needs. Don't ever resent the preacher for preaching to the sinner. Okay? Don't ever resent the preacher for trying to relate to the sinner. Don't ever resent the preacher for trying to be as, uh, shall we say, uh, connective as possible with the sinner because that's what the prophet's going to do with David. He tells him a story of shepherds. There's this one man, had many, many sheep. Uh, he was quite wealthy, whole hillside covered with the sheep. And uh, he, he had a neighbor who was a very, very poor man, only had one little lamb, one little lamb. And David's thinking this is a transgression in his own kingdom, and he's sitting there as a king. He's already moved past his sin. He thinks it's hidden in the closet of his heart, uh, and the prophet challenges him. And so this man who had many, many, many sheep, no shortage of sheep or lambs, he, he looked upon his neighbor's one lamb, and he decided that not only would it be enough for him to have all his many sheep, but he deserved that one lamb that was held by his neighbor. And so what he did is he arranged to steal that lamb and to kill that man and take the one sheep, that the one lamb that that man had. And David is aroused in his anger and he steps forth as a king 
pronouncing judgment on the rich man in the story, ready to intervene as a righteous judge, ready to intervene and represent justice and truth, ready to do his God-given kingship duties, ready to act, and the prophet drops the hammer upon him, catches him right in his indignation, catches him right in his dismissal, right in his self-deception. And he says, thou art the man. You know, when people criticize us, it never feels fair. Uh, We want to tell the story our way. Uh, David's surprised that he has uh, been challenged by the prophet, but he does something that reveals his heart and reveals why he had a heart inclined toward God after the things of God. David at this moment has a second choice to make. Do I retreat into my right of kingship? Do I justify myself? Do I say, uh, I, it is my army. I can order it how I am supposed to. God's the one who gave me this job. If Uriah died on a battlefield, uh, that's me running the army that God gave me according to the authority that God gave me. <clears throat> David can, if he wants to, make an argument for himself. He can defend himself. He can say, I'm the king. Uh, he can say, did not you, did not Samuel the prophet prophesy and say that when kings were elected, uh, they would take your sons and your daughters? All I am doing is fulfilling the prophecy of the prophet. If David wants to make a religious argument to justify himself, he can do it. If he wants to make a civil argument, he can do it. If he wants to hide behind his status as commander in chief, he can do it. But if he does that, he will follow in the path of Saul, which has a heart that is not willing to be rebuked, that is not willing to repent, that is not willing to bow a knee, but has a heart that wants to justify, wants to defend. And when the word of God is not wholly followed, they say, oh, I did wholly follow. And the prophet says, no, you didn't. And Saul says, yes, I did. And then he says, look, I didn't even do it. I didn't even do it. Uh, or did, He says, uh, we, it, uh, we were doing it for religious reasons. We were going to offer a sacrifice. That doesn't work in the prophet. Then he uses his third excuse. Oh, it wasn't even me. It was the people. The path of Saul is the refusal to humble our heart and receive rebuke from the presence of God and the anointed of God in our life. And David, at this moment, knows he can fool some of the people some of the time, but he can fool his God none of the time. And he decides at that moment, uh, it is not time to posture. It is not time to justify. It is time to repent. And he says immediately to the prophet, I have sinned against the Lord. As soon as he admits his sin, notice how fast pardon comes. Immediately, Nathan replied, the Lord has taken away your sin. Mercy is an amazing thing. After all the terrible things that David had done, He's betrayed God, he's betrayed the people, he's betrayed Uriah, he's betrayed the nameless people in a purposeless attack who died alongside Uriah against the enemy. David gets to confess and his sin is just gone. Do you want the gospel to shock you? The answer is yes. Mercy rewrote my life. There are consequences to David's sin and you will see them ripple through his life. There are, there's tragedy, there are consequences, there are reaping what he has sown, and these all will be in his life. But in terms of his standing before God, he is instantly forgiven. How is this possible? I want to show you something in the scripture here very quickly. How is it possible that in this moment, David goes from breaking half the laws of the, New Test, of, of the uh, Ten Commandments to being forgiven in a moment? How is this possible? David is in his palace. He is accosted by the prophet. And when the sinner is revealed, the prophet points a finger at him and says, thou art the man. And the truth is, the prophet can stand in any of our life and point a finger at us and say, you are the man, you are the woman, you are the transgressor, you are the sinner, you are the one who needs an altar because, honey, we all need an altar. 
The prophet can stand in any of our life. What are we going to do with the reality that there is a finger of judgment pointed at all of us that says, thou art the man. I want you to see the difference, the comparison. Two moments in the gospel story. First, Jesus is about to be baptized by John the Baptist. And John the Baptist stuns the the world of, of, of theology. And he astounds all who had the sin of destiny to see his words when he says, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sins of the world. That's the first scene. Now I want to take you to the second scene. After Jesus has been betrayed, after he is taken into the judgment hall, after Pilate has had him scourged and beaten, after he is already condemned, he is brought again to stand before the people who cried for his crucifixion, who shouted aloud for his his death. He's again presented to them. And what does Pilate say? Pointing at Jesus, behold the man. In David's sin, you have the prophet saying, thou art the man. John the Baptist is baptizing Jesus says, behold the lamb. And Pilate looks at a points to a beaten and riven Savior and says, behold the man. This is how you get to mercy. God takes the sin and the transgression of all of us and he places it upon himself. Hence, we have a story of mercy and we have a testimony of grace. Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sins of the world. And the sins that were paid for at Calvary, watch, watch this just for a moment. It's maybe a little bit more theological than a lot of you are used to. But let me just lay this on you for your consideration here today. The sins that are paid for at Calvary do not just go forward in time to encompass and embrace all of us transgressors. The sins paid for at Calvary go back in time and wash away the sin even of a transgressor like King David. Even like a man who murdered his friend. Even like a man who slept with his friend's wife. Even a man who has transgressed in such a horrible manner. Calvary's washing goes forward to us and backward to him. And you say how do you know that theologically? I'll read to you second, excuse me, I'll read to you Romans chapter number three, starting at verse number 23. For all have sinned, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God set forth as a propitiation by his blood, through faith, to demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance, God had passed over the sins that were previously committed. That's verse 25. To demonstrate at the present time his righteousness, whose righteousness? God's righteousness. That he might be just And the justifier, Mm, I love it, of the one who has faith in Jesus. David is a picture of grace. He is a picture of mercy. And at all points, just as the 89 messianic prophecies of the Psalms pointed to Jesus, just as David sees more beautifully than any writer in the Old Testament how mercy and truth have kissed in Jesus Christ. In this manner, David sees the price of his sin paid for by someone else, and he is willing to trust and believe in the mercy of God. It's so beautiful to me how David immediately repents of his sin. He immediately humble himself. Uh, many people go into defensive mode when you criticize them, but David says immediately, I have sinned against the Lord. And God meets him at his repentance and says, the Lord has put away your sin. God knew, uh, uh, David knew that God was righteous and would not stand for sin, but he also knew that he was merciful. We preached about that last Sunday. He knew he was righteous, but he also knew he was merciful and he knew that God had a steadfast love that would endure forever and he knew the heart of God would welcome back any wandering uh, prodigal child 
that would return in repentance. David has obviously transgressed. He has sinned against Uriah both in, uh, both in adultery. He sinned against Uriah when he tried to get him drunk. So he would go home and see his wife. Uriah wouldn't go home to see his wife. So David got him drunk, thinking he would go home drunk. He still refuses. Then he murders him. He puts a stumbling block in the path of Joab by making Joab a, 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 an accessory to the the murder. Then he writes, uh, he, he, when he wrote the letter of command to Joab, he lies to the people around him. He may have coerced Bathsheba. We do not know. He was king. He set a horrible example before his family. He sinned against all his family. He sinned against uh, these individuals in his life. But when he repents, he understands that the greatest sin is the sin against God. And he says, against you, you only have I sinned. The story does not end just here with this reconciliation uh, of mercy. There is also, and you see it here, you see uh, the attitude and the heart of David's repentance. And I'm, I'm ending musicians, you can come. There is this attitude and heart of repentance in David. David, upon leaving the presence of the prophet, he begins to write a song of repentance. There are several songs of repentance in the Psalms. This is the first one that he wrote. I will give you part of it, and I want you to consider it and apply it into your, uh, your own heart. Have mercy upon me, O God. According to your loving kindness, according to the multitude of your tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity. Cleanse me from my sins. Hear David, for I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is always before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done this evil in your sight that you may be found just when you speak and blameless when you judge. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity and sin my mother conceived me. Behold, you desire truth in the inward parts and in the hidden part you will make me to know wisdom. Purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me hear joy and gladness. that the bones you have broken may rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O oh God, and renew a steadfast, a right spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me by your generous spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners shall be converted to you. This is not the only psalm of repentance. David will write, if we understand the chronology of these psalms, David will write, not, not far after this, David will write Psalms 25. To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. O my God, I trust in you. Let me not be ashamed. Let not my enemies triumph over me. Let no one who waits on you be ashamed. Let those who be ashamed, let those be ashamed who deal treacherously without cause. Show me your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth and teach me, for you are the God of my salvation. On you I wait all the day. Remember, O Lord, your tender mercies and your loving kindnesses, for they are from old. Do not remember the sins of my youth, nor my transgressions. According to your mercy, remember me. For your goodness sake, O Lord. and on and on turn yourself to me and have mercy on me for I am desolate and afflicted the troubles of my heart have enlarged bring me out of my distresses look on my affliction and my pain and forgive all my sins songs 
of repentance. You will sing many songs in your life. The seasons of our life are sure and just as relentless and implacable as time marches for all of us. The seasons come and go. You will sing many songs in your life. I hope you sing songs of joy. I want to sing songs of joy. I hope you sing songs of thanksgiving in your life. I hope you know how to sing a song of victory. There's nothing more fun in your life than singing a song of victory. I hope you learn how to sing songs of testimony. I hope you learn how to sing with a loud voice and I hope you sing, baby, sing. I hope you sing in the shower. I hope you sing in the car. I hope you sing and make your kids ask you to quit singing. I hope you sing when you're crying. I hope you sing when you're sad. I hope you learn how to sing in the prayer room when you're the only one in there. I hope you learn how to take the saddest day of your life when you are emptied and shattered. Pick a song from the repertoire of your story and sing it before the Lord. I hope you sing. When I finished six months of chemotherapy, I'm a cancer survivor, many of you know. I finished six months of chemotherapy. I was in terrible, terrible physical condition. Many, many people, some of you know, some of you have done this. I was in terrible condition. I was so weak, I couldn't walk. I couldn't climb stairs. I literally could take, climb one stair at a time. They put me in an ICU because I had viral pneumonia. And I, I, could, I got to a point where I couldn't talk. And my, uh, my oncology nurse who had sat with me for six months and put one bag of poison after another in my body and held my hand. She gave me a, a little book that was based on that country music song, I Hope You Dance. You know that country music song, I Hope You Dance? I was so, in the last chemo, I was so sick of, sick of the drugs. Forgive me for a personal story, but I, I want to make a point with it. Um, I wouldn't take any more drugs and I started, I started, um, how can I say this? Um, I started hurling and they didn't want me doing that. There's a lot of people in there. I'm making everybody sick. I'm horribly sick. I'm, I'm, I'm literally on my knees sick. And she tricked me. She came over and she, her and my wife ganged up on me and they said, they just give me a little bit of a drug, some thinner again, but they lied to me. They gave me a double dose. They put it right in that vein and they shot that drug in there and my whole world swirled and I just went out. And I told them, I said, you both lied to me, you dirty dogs, you lied to me. I went out, I woke up, it's my last, my last treatment. She gave me this present, this book, and the book's called, I Hope You Dance. In the back of it was the CD and she said, wherever you go next, I hope. I still go back there once a year and I still see her occasionally if she's on ship. She said, I hope you dance. Don't just survive. Dance. Let there be a point to surviving. <laughs> Some of you guys have lived through hell. Forgive me for cussing in church. I'm just kind of in the mood today. Some of you guys have lived through it. Sing on the other side of hell. Sing, dance. But in all your singing, don't forget how to sing a song of repentance. Because if there's one thing I know you're going to need in your life, you're going to have to come to an altar. You're going to have to say, it's me again, oh Lord. Will you wash me and make me whiter than snow? Because if you can do that, if you can sing that song of repentance, your imperfections will be washed under the blood. Your error will be placed under mercy. Your sickness, your sadness, your sorrow, your shame will all be washed in the beautiful perfection and righteousness of Jesus Christ. And you will be made to be like him, a possessor of his righteousness. Let's all stand. Thank you for watching First Church Charlotte. 
If you're in the Charlotte, North Carolina area, come join us at 4929 North Sharon Amity Road at the corner of Shamrock Drive, Sunday mornings at 9 and 11 a.m., and Bible study Wednesdays at 7.30 p.m. Online, find us at firstchurchclt.com or like us on Facebook or Twitter. We hope to see you soon. Come worship with us.